Um, so my name is Matt Bonds. I'm uh, a faculty at Harvard Medical School, but I'm not a doctor. I'm actually trained as um, a theoretical ecologist, like Alan, and an economist, like Mark. Those are my, that's where my training comes from. And uh, I've never actually given a talk following a theoretical ecologist and an economist <laughs> in my life. And I'm really excited about that, because uh, it means I don't have to explain quite as much uh, when I present some of these figures, I think. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm genuinely grateful for whoever <laughs> organized this. It's the first time in my life that I get this pleasure. Um, so, you know, uh, in addition to being an economist and theoretical ecologist, you know, Mark, you're talking about sort of bridging the worlds of the implementers and the, and the academics, and um, I'm, I do that as well, and to the point where we're implementers. So I'm a, in addition to my academic we started an organization called Pivot. It's a healthcare delivery organization and research organization that works in Madagascar. And we do data collection, but we primarily provide services. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical work uh, that relates to these themes of resilience uh, and the, the very practical work um, of implementing and then some of the data in between. And I'll try to close this loop um, around the theory and the implementation. I'm not going to do it perfectly because uh, the work, the implementation is only a few years old, so we have preliminary results, but over time I think we'll be able to uh, apply uh, our work there to, to new theories. <clears throat> so the outline of my talk is about sort of a language, uh, a term that I'm using increasingly, the ecology of poverty and disease. Um, I'll discuss, that'll be a th mostly a theoretical exercise, limited empirical support. I'll discuss some examples of model systems, real systems, uh, human systems in the field, first in Rwanda and then Madagascar. Um, our data platform for um, studying those systems in real time as they evolve and uh, how we can use that to ask bigger questions. <clears throat> so, you know, fortunately, I don't, I don't need to restate a lot of the problems in the world. Uh, I thought Mark did a really good job of that. The, a couple of things that I would emphasize um, are, uh, as an ecologist, I tend to sort of see the elements in which people are embedded into natural systems. So um, as Mark pointed out, almost a billion people in the world live uh, below the international poverty line. Um, most of the poor people, this is per capita income for countries around the world. This is latitude. Most of the poor live in the tropics. Um, most of the poor die from infectious diseases, um, and most infectious diseases of poverty are environmentally transmitted. So all this is, these are, this is a distrib global distribution of vector-borne and parasitic diseases. These are like malaria and schistosomiasis and hookworm. Uh, those are also in the tropics. They live part of their life cycle outside of the human host. They're entirely driven by humans. And this is just to say that there are sort of these kind of big stark patterns in the world and that, that are consistent with a story of um, the role of environment on shaping people's livelihoods. <clears throat> so this is, I'll just walk through a simple schematic of how I think about this, but this is a person, as you can imagine. It's a person. Uh, these are, this is parasitic diseases. Um, and I, a lot of my work uh, focuses on understanding the dynamics between these two, you know, uh, the models of infectious diseases are drawn from ultimately the lack of Altera models that Alan presented. You know, they're, they're essentially from predator-prey models. Um, they can be modeled explicitly. Um, people, of course, are, most of the poor are living subsistence livelihoods, sort of like what Mark was saying. And as an ecologist, I see this as almost more of um, a food web story than an economic story. The economic story is super important, not to minimize it, but you have a situation here where this person's livelihood is going to depend a lot on what's going on right here. The energy going into this system that's collected by these plants depends on the soil microbes. They consume that, and then there's another bunch of organisms uh, that are both uh, directly in competition for these resources in this person, and also will actually, um, there are pests that will also consume um, crops. So these are, well, the broad term that we use in ecology is these natural enemies of human beings. And, uh, and among the extreme poor, these, you know, um, I would argue that 
that these forces, these sort of natural forces, are more dominant than a lot of market forces in the sense that you don't have as much, market forces aren't determining sunshine and rainfall uh, or as much the dynamics of these. They're not irrelevant, but um, there's a lot also going on in addition to market forces. So that's sort of my eco ecological interest in these dynamics. <clears throat> so I'm actually not gonna get into the models in detail, but I just wanted to share that. We've been working on sort of presenting basic general models of how um, livelihoods, economic development, economic growth can be coupled to natural systems in the most general form. So um, economists uh, track economic growth in the most broad terms in terms of the dynamics of capital. And so those of you who are economists would recognize this as looking a lot like a pretty classic economic growth equation. <clears throat> uh, these capital for, and among, especially among the poor, and in direct ways this is true for middle and, and, and industrialized economies, but among the poor it's more direct, at least poor rural households. And so this capital is often natural capital, it's biological resources, it's fisheries, it's crops, uh, it's um, livestock. And natural enemies broadly are organisms that are competing with this for, hum for human beings. So these are infectious diseases of people. These are, again, just to emphasize, those are other biological systems that have their own intrinsic dynamics. These are um, you know, organisms that compete with human beings for, um, for resources like termites or pests of crops or livestock par parasites. <clears throat> And so just to give you one of the most simplest examples and one that we developed a lot, this is sort of in a very uh, slightly more explicit model, not totally explicit of an infectious disease model. So those of you who do work in infectious disease would recognize this immediately as a dynamic, as, as sort of a transmission term, as a function of the number of susceptible in the population, number of infected, et cetera. So the idea here is to have a, as general model as possible. It's consistent with economic theory. It's consistent with e ecological theory. And it, um, it applies in a direct way to these kinds of systems. <clears throat> so uh, again, not to go on this, like, I mean, what I love is that I feel like Alan has done all the hard work for me. So people, some of you will recognize this as um, a bifurcation diagram. The an interesting feature of these systems is that they have nonlinearities. Biological systems have nonlinearities. They're, in, they're intrinsic, actually, to most biological systems. When you couple uh, capital of, of human beings with, with biological processes that underlie that, there are, and you model that across a pretty big parameter range, the entire parameter range that we can find, these things are, these in those systems are those nonlinearities. So this is an example of an outcome at, of one, at one parameter set of, um, of biostability, where you have multiple equilibria, stable, high income, low disease equilibrium, high disease, low income, right, where you're having positive feedbacks for people with high incomes have less disease because they have less transmission, higher recovery. People with high disease have a lower income because they're less productive and they can acquire capital at lower rates. Those are sort of the intrinsic mechanisms in there and you can have multiple um, equilibria. <clears throat> this is a bifurcation diagram. So, so these, are, these are state variables, disease, income. These are, uh, <laughs> This is to be totally clear, income is generated from capital, just for, if you're not tracking that. These are parameters, I'm sorry, this is a parameter, this is a state variable. So this is just showing that it, how, whether you get biostability or not depends on the parameters that you have and as at very low transmission rates in this particular system, you have very low disease of course. As that increases, you get multiple equilibria. The blue are stable equilibria. The red is an unstable equilibria as you keep on going. Um, that system becomes more stable and good. This is an infectious disease system. This is a renewable, a renewable resource system. The only, thing to, the only thing to draw from this is just that, uh, is that the models, even the most general models, not a lot of assumptions built into the models. Those systems, they have these features because you're, you're talking about nonlinear ecological systems. <clears throat> and the rub here is that we have no idea we have no idea uh, where populations fall into these systems. We can identify parameters for some aspects of the models, and so some parameters we can come up with a range, and some we're really guessing. So we actually, what we've done is, um, is 
just look at the entire parameter space, that a feasible parameter space that we can find, making no, no comment about where our countries particularly land. And what, you'll, what we find is in infectious disease systems, you have pretty large non-trivial portions that are bi-stable, pretty large portions that are, this is the development equilibrium, pretty large portions that are poor. In the renew, renewable resource models, we have a much lower proportion of the population that's proportion of the parameters that are bi-stable. A simple reason for that is this is all about positive feedback. Right, so infectious diseases, people, these are the, this is a virtuous, vicious cycle story where people who are wealthier get sick less, acquire human capital more, get, uh, get education, learning, and are, more, are productive. And people who are uh, poor get infected more, they have solar recovery rates, et cetera. So um, that's a positive feedback, vicious and virtuous cycle. And the renewable resource story where you've got sort of inherent limits to the, the actual um, renewable capital, you have sort of negative feedback mechanisms. That's sort of the bottom line story. I wouldn't overly interpret that, but the, what, we're, what, what, they, the, what they would beg in, in my mind is um, figuring out which part, of the, which part of the world people fall in this parameter space. Just to emphasize this one more time, you know, we're talking about one in seven people in the world live in extreme poverty. So they're, uh, for you, whatever you want to call that, that's persistent poverty. We can call that a poverty trap. Something has to explain the persistence of extreme poverty. And there's basically a couple stories. We either have a story where you've got a stable, globally stable, poor equilibrium, or you have an unstable one. <coughs> so we've, um, the empirical support for this is, uh, is it ranges. And, you know, some people have done really good work in finding at the micro level evidence of sort of these kind of non-linearities. I'll just give one sort of really uh, simple example that we did. We took all the wealthy countries in the world, and all the poor countries in the world, and estimated these curves. This is an income curve as a function of disease. This is a disease curve as a function of income. And identified whether those things are, have negative feedbacks. And they do, but these are for the poor and the unpoor, <laughs> uh, the most developed and least developed. It's consistent. You could make an argument, actually, that's consistent with both a single stable equilibrium where the parameters are different or one unstable equilibrium. These are, just to be clear, this is the, the infectious disease burden of countries throughout the world. This is their income. Hugs the axis. Just shows you there's a huge range in the world. Um, it also shows you that above a certain income, people just aren't sit that sick. And above a certain disease burden, people just aren't that wealthy. And so it kind of reinforces some of those concepts of reinforcing feedback. So this, the principles, this, the, the summary here is that um, uh, coupled systems of ecology and poverty can be derived from explicit models from economics and the biological sciences. So that's a nice feature, that you can just, you can be true to economics, you can be true to uh, ecology, and both in spirit and also in the technical work. <coughs> The models have inherent nonlinearities. It's a general feature of the models. And so there are inherent traps um, in the sense that you have portions of the parameter space where um, if you're born poor, uh, then reinforcing mechanisms would keep one poor. <clears throat> so bi-stability implies that large changes in state variables can cause changes in long-term trajectories. Uh, but systems are more resilient in the parameter space of globally stable good equilibria. So even like if you, if you had a choice, not that we always do, but if we, th when we think about this, if you have a bi-stable system, then changes in a state of state variables, a positive shock um, would be predicted to have a long-term positive outcome. Likewise, a negative shock would predict to have a long-term negative outcome. Those are, uh, those are problems, obviously. And uh, shifting parameters across that, Shifting, shifting parameters, this system is obviously very, I, I would call that very unresilient, trap of poverty. This is another form of trap of poverty by stability, and this is a trap of good things. So shifting parameters, uh, good parameter shifts, these are structural changes um, in these kinds of models um, has just obvious inherent advantages, if that was a choice. <clears throat> So I was like, I was trained as a theoretician. That's my natural inclination. Um, uh, but of course, my, my search for in this world has been for understanding these systems uh, in reality, with both through direct observation and collecting data. And that has itself come up with new challenges. So 
my goal in life when I was younger was how can I get the data? <laughs> how can we measure this? And uh, uh, so that you can actually calibrate these models, understand them better, test them against other alternative models. Um, and what, for that to happen, what's really nice is a lot of change over time and fundamental variables like health and economic outcomes, ideally. You can see sig signals of that in cross-country data or cross-population data. But, um, but that's sort of the problem with that is that once you start getting in the business of, um, of poverty and disease and populations that suffer poverty and disease, uh, there's a whole bu other bunch of issues at work. And so I, f I first became interested in saying, OK, like, I, please, can I find a system where we're seeing rapid change, where we can affect change, where we can measure that change? Uh, and slowly over time, I've kind of converted into someone who tries to study that change, to someone who, who, for whom the priority is just how can we make change, you know, as a first order priority. Um, you know, in order not only to collect the data because it's such an inherently challenging problem in and of itself. So I've sort of slowly become sort of a systems person in general, a system of disease person, a system of healthcare person. And I've got really interested in sort of like the pieces of this puzzle, the larger piece of this puzzle that can lead to sort of fundamental changes over here. <coughs> so, so I'm going to take a, what will feel like a slight detour and sort of put the theoretical stuff aside for a moment, talk about um, sort of uh, the gentleman over here, I think your name might have been John, which is like, how do you do anything, right? I would talk about the process of doing something and um, learning about that and then circle back around on the theory. So in global health, I chose global health in particular in terms of other, uh, as opposed to other ventures in this is because global health people think um, they have a lot of solutions. And the answer, the truth is they do have a lot of solutions. We actually do know a lot about how to treat malaria. We know malaria treatment's effective. You know, we know how to treat HIV. We know how to treat TB. Actually, we know how to treat diarrhea. We know how to prevent most of these things. There's a, quite a lot of knowledge, a lot of wonderful examples out there of how these things get done. And so in terms of just a, an efficient way of creating change, it became sort of a no-brainer that starting with healthcare is a really good way to go as a foundation. It's not preventive, but it's a really good solution to immediate problems. And syst if you create systems of healthcare, then that's a long-term solution. The problem with everything I just said is that we know a lot of individual interventions. So we have a lot of scientific advances. <clears throat> but there's a pretty good back gap between the advances and their application, between what we know and what's actually being done as the director of the WHO. Um, it's been estimated that as many as 10 million deaths could be averted annually using existing technologies and services in the world. And there's an article about the uh, science of scale up by Margaret Kruk at Harvard last year in PLOS Biology. And she said, you know, closing this gap between what we know and what we do has been a really hard challenge. <clears throat> so I'd argue that the reason why it's a hard challenge is because, um, is because the whole is not the same as the sum of the parts. And so implementing uh, individual isolated interventions, uh, those things do not necessarily uh, in, uh, improve systems. And in fact, even the most n cheap, narrowly defined, clear interventions, say treating someone for mal malaria requires all kinds of other stuff. It requires supply chains, it requires that there's personnel at health centers, it requires that they're being able to test, it requires that those personnel are being compensated. Uh, it requires that the person is able to get there, and then it requires a system of financing. So who's going to pay for that? And those systems are non-trivial. They're actually not expensive, as it turns out. Everything I just said has a number on it. The numbers are actually really low, but implementing them is actually really difficult. And so, um, and the evidence for changing health systems is really difficult. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a new problem that I've sort of adopted, which is how do you affect change? How do you produce knowledge on affecting change at a pretty serious scale, a population scale? And I want to emphasize this point, which is like a um, this is like uh, this is worth overemphasizing in my view. The sort of in academic circles, as it, as as Mark was saying, sort of uh, you're, we're in a room with academics and implementers, and they can't talk to each other. They drink different drinks and they have different conversations at different tables. So that's just even true, of course, of policymakers. And usually in academic circles, what we say is, how do we get the policymakers makers to listen to us? Right? It's like they just don't listen. You know. Uh, I would argue that, like, um, that they actually do listen <laughs> more often than you realize. Uh, you know, in, play, in, in, the, in the field of global health in particular, um, 
the policies are on the books pretty nicely. The WHO makes recommendations. Countries all over the world adopt those recommendations. We know, like, we know what drugs are supposed to be in health facilities. We know what training people are should get. We know how many doctors, nurses, and midwives should be there. We know all that stuff. We even know how to. We know we have very specific pr clinical protocols of how to diagnose and treat children. It's just. It's just it doesn't work, you know, because it's easy to write on paper. It's easy for WHO to recommend. So there's a whole new problem, which is implementing. And so the question that I'm always interested in is like, well, how can we use, how can we have the implementation form of the research, the research is generating and answering questions that is not just useful to policymakers, but also actually can change implementation. So that's sort of like the foundation of what I'm interested in these days is like, how can we make change, collect data, and have the kind of design, research design so that there, it's, it's amenable to an adaptive, the adaptive bottom-up process of creating change. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you two examples. Briefly, I'll talk about Rwanda, and then I'll talk about Madagascar. So I used to work in, in Rwanda, primarily in Rwanda. I lived there for five years. Um, <clears throat> and I worked with an organization called Partners in Health, which was the largest non-governmental healthcare provider in the country at that time. Um, Partners in Health, for some of you might know it because the founder is a pretty famous guy named Paul Farmer and uh, he's also at Harvard Medical School. <clears throat> so the, the language you use in global health around trading, improving systems is health system strengthening. It's its own buzzword, probably not as much of a buzzword in this room as resilience is. Um, uh, people hate it because it can mean a lot of different things to different people. It has all kinds of classifications. The language that we use sometimes now is that it refers to staff stuff, stuff system and space. But for us, what it meant was in a small part of Rwanda, we would strengthen the entire health system in that location. So that would, the system is designed by like a hospital, and then a network of health centers, and then a network of community health workers that live and work in those villages that report up to the health centers, and you have sort of an integrated system. So that tra treatment, Patients are identified, they're diagnosed, they're treated, and they can move up and down that system according to need. So sometimes they're moving up the system to get treatment, sometimes they're moving down the system so they can get you know, treatment for chronic diseases at the community level. <clears throat> so the problem with this study, so in the, when we started in Eastern Rwanda, the under five mortality rate in 2005, the estimated one is about 24%, super high. One in four children died before they were five years old. This is, a country, this is an area that was, um, largely displaced after the genocide. They're still recovering. Um, this is much higher than even what was really a large, a pretty high under five mortality rate for the rest of rural Rwanda of about 16%. <clears throat> and what ha what, the way that Paul Farmer would talk about what we're doing is he'd say we have a shock and all approach. Help stre strengthen these systems is do infrastructure work, hire people, treat people, go crazy. <clears throat> And the effect of that, rather remarkably, is we saw some of the fastest declines in mortality rates in the world in that area. Really fast declines. So Rwanda was experiencing, it was recovering from the genocide, it was receiving a lot of support. Uh, under five mortality, we went from what was pretty high for the developing world to what was actually pretty normal, even starting to become pretty good for the developing world in the first five years. And in our area, this is our, specifically the area that we intervened, just to be clear, this is like the specific area uh, saw rates of decline, they're almost twice the rate of the rest of the country. So this is, as far as I know, if someone has counter evidence to this, I'd love, or alter, better evidence, I think this is the fastest rate of a population level change in mortality rates that, in the world at the time. The problem with that is it doesn't help us with our knowledge gap that much. We have a lot of implementers, they've learned a lot about all the mechanisms of doing that, partnering with the government, this is all the public system, you know, developing MOUs, developing some supply chains, hiring people, training them, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we also don't know how to interpret these data. You know, Rwanda's a little bit of an outlier. You know, there's all this other stuff going on that a lot of people are coming, a lot of entities around the world are coming to the country. Has a single President Paul Kagame, who was a general, who sort of ran the government like an army. Um, data systems are retrofitted. This, is, this confidence interval is so big because we didn't have a true baseline. All, all we had, this is 2005, this is 2010, all we, these are villages where data came. These are just a national survey that we were able to sort of pick up on which ones were fell into our area. 
<coughs> five years later, this is here, here's, here's an organization, the, the largest non-government health care provider in the country, spending $14 million a year. It takes them five years to get a baseline study, a proper baseline study. So this is the best data, five years later, unfortunately, smaller confidence intervals. So the same with health systems. The data that were coming from the health systems um, it was weak when the organization started. So finally, the story looks like it's, it could be a story of convergence, not, not divergence, not having a bigger impact than the rest of the country. So this leaves a lot of, this in, in my view, just for the record, you know, we're submitting this, in the process of submitting this now. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be haters, that's what I call them, who will say things like, um, you know, it's, it, they'll say this is the story, right? And the reason I call them haters is I'll say, well, we're seeing a miracle, you know, happen. So let's figure out, let's like figure out what, what the miracle is and what's driving that change. I mean, you know, we don't know exactly what the what driver is, but we should be open to it. And there's data now to 2015, so we should figure it out. <clears throat> so a few years ago, we were invited to start working in Madagascar. Um, it was the country director of the Partners Health Site in Rwanda, who was sort of the leading physician and kind of implementer, and it was me who was sort of a leading researcher at the time. And we were frustrated. We spent all this time in Rwanda. It was so difficult to collect the right data, get the right people on board. Um, it, it, collaborating with each other was difficult. These different experts sort of in the middle of like, again, retrofitting a problem. And we were really excited about a new opportunity in a new country where um, maybe we could do everything better, both from an organizational level and also um, from a data perspective. So why Madagascar? <clears throat> so Madagascar, many of you don't know, because Madagascar, um, it's technically part of Africa, of course, but it doesn't consider itself African. Uh, it's actually one of the poorest countries in the world. It has a mortality rate, not at least in our district, of one in six, which is exactly where the rest of rural Rwanda was in 2005. It has the highest, in our district at least, is the high, we have the highest uh, maternal mortality rates that would, if they were national, that anywhere in the world. Uh, and per capita health spending across the country is the lowest in the world, $14 per capita. So that compares to, say, depending on who's estimating, $50 to $100 for most African countries um, compared to the US. I don't know how many of you are Canadian. I'm guessing 80%. <laughs> in the US, we spend about eight, eight, a little over $8,000 a year on healthcare. I'm sure in Canada, it's like 4,000 or something, right? Um, Still a lot compared to Madagascar. So this is what health centers look like. This is actually the best health center that we were, were working on when we started. This is in Rana Mafana, um, which is actually a tourist area. They were, it was, it's pathetic. The, this health system doesn't actually, didn't actually function. It's just a meager skeleton with little tiny structures that showed some evidence that once maybe something was happening. <clears throat> we were really fortunate um, that we were invited by uh, this woman, Pat Wright, who'd been lived, working there for three decades. She started a national park, Ronald National Park. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, they've been doing research. They now have this incredible research facility with an infectious disease lab. And she was guided by this man, Benjamin Andrea Miaha, who's now on our board. And he's sort of like the ultimate guru, and he's the person who you should talk to when you want to get your stuff going. So he'll, um, he'll he's like the ultimate guide. And, so we were, we were guided really nicely in a country of people who have been working there for decades, under, working in this particular region for decades, had really good relationships with the government. And that is, as always, that's one of the hardest elements, is just how do you properly integrate um, in a place. <clears throat> so P Pivot is an NGO. I think I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm one of the CEOs of the organization, one of the co-founders. Our first goal is to advance health as a human right. It's not particular research. Goal. But we do want to create a model health district for, for Madagascar. So the government has adopted us as um, a model organization. And we think that if we can show what it can do in the country based on government policies, um, then we can do something, we can scale something, scale what we do there. <clears throat> we hope, we believe that if we can do this, which requires data and impacts, then that'll be a good foundation for the bigger questions, the fundamental questions of what's driving poverty and disease um, and sustainable development. <clears throat> So, I don't know how much time I have. This is when I start getting nervous. The You've got about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, good, perfect. I don't want to be in that situation. Uh, so, um, so, okay. 
So this is Madagascar again. Um, we're operating in a single district. Again, the goal is to create a model district. This is the district of Ifana Dean. This is a national park, Ranam Ifana National Park. Um, it's a population of about 200,000 people. And our goal was to convert this area where there's health centers, it's district hospital, network of community health workers as one that, the, that is scalable across the country, works well, provides services. And the key piece of this among the, well, there's a lot of key pieces, but among the most key pieces is that this is, these are the existing, this is the existing system. So we work in the existing system. These are just, this is the national, this is the Ministry of Health Hospital that we work in right here. We, these are Ministry of Health Health Centers and the Community Health Worker Network is actually a Ministry of Health endorsed network. And the policies that we implement are almost all Ministry of Health endorsed policies. So almost 95% of what we do are, is, on, is in the book. So we just work with them. We say, okay, you say that, you know, we're supposed to treat children in this way. You know, the health centers don't have the forms to like to do the diagnosis and treatment. Let's help get the forms or, you know, the pharmacist was supposed to get paid. They're not getting paid. Let's help them get paid, that kind of story. Some people aren't trained in certain things. We bring trainers from the national government, from the capital, to, the, to our area, to, from the Ministry of Health to do the trainings, that kind of story. <clears throat> so the term health system strengthening is like, again, the staff stuff systems in space means little to a lot of people. And so I'll try to be just slightly more specific. So the two categories of health system strengthening that we sort of classify, one is broad systems readiness. So this is infrastructure, uh, you know, equipment, the labs, Staffing, we bring all of the Ministry of Health staffing to norms. So this is like a doctor, nurse, and midwife in all the health centers. And at the district hospital, there's you know, radiologist, surgeon, um, lab tech, things like that. <clears throat> and the supply chain management. So um, at, in this district, as it turns out, uh, there are about 100 Ministry of Health staff. Our organization, Pivot, provides the resources for about 50 of them, so about half of the Ministry of Health staff in the district. And in addition to that, we have in our organization, those are clinical staff. In addition to our, to that we have, our own organization has about 180 staff total. About 50 of those are clinical staff as well. So this includes ambulance drivers, you know, uh, nurses, guards, cleaners, things like that. <clears throat> so this is actually that health center that I, sh I pointed you to originally that had nothing, nothing but, uh, um, an empty room. Um, this is sort of examples of, you know, we have a, the country's only ambulance system. It's, the, it's actually, this is one of the few things that are not part of the national protocol. Um, we, th we think it'd be a wise move over time. It's an inevitable move over time. It actually is a really important role for us because when someone's, if you're strengthening the health center and the hospital, but someone's diagnosed in the health center, they have to go to a hospital. Right now in, Man in Madagascar, there's no way for them to get there. They have to hire a taxi. And um, in addition, just to be completely clear how the policies work, patients pay for 100, almost 100% of all of their ex consumables. So if they need, if you, if you need an IV bag or your doctor needs surgical gloves, you'd have to buy that in a little pharmacy like this before they would treat you. <clears throat> so the other thing, so those are sort of systems uh, interventions, these are, these are clinical interventions. So there's, you know, a malnutrition program, treatment program, um, tuberculosis program, it's getting started, a maternal and child health program. And in both cases, just to emphasize this, these are oper operating at all three levels. This is like really important because the community health workers might be able to treat and diagnose patients to some extent, but almost most of the time they need to refer them to something that works. And in any event, they are supervised at the health center level. Same with um, the health center hospital relationship. <clears throat> so we have like, this is an example of a community-based polio campaign. These are social workers who have kits for the families. This is one of our, our star doctors, one of the patients. <clears throat> so the two big challenges to this is that we need, um, so just the intervention is super challenging, as you can imagine, right? So especially trying to, you know, the, the shock and all approach is we can affect, change can be affected. We've seen it happen in places like Rwanda. Um, we, we know, we actually have a, got, a map of what it would look like, uh, how to, what it should look like once we're, we've accomplished it. The process of accomplishing it is pretty complicated. Um, and at the same time, we have a whole data platform that we need to collect, that we don't want to retrofit, that we want to, um, we're going to implement 
uh, at the beginning. So we simultaneously um, have sort of two main sources of data. One are uh, sort of standard monitoring evaluation, health management information systems. These are data that are collected by at the at the registry level. These are so we these are just sort of standard indicators that are collected at the national level that we can collect locally as well and that we can put into a database. Um, and then in addition, we have um, a baseline study. So this is sort of this is one of this is one thing that we wasn't we weren't able to do in Rwanda. Uh, this is through the National Institute of Statistics, it's a subcontract to them. Uh, they do the data that are that are collected are uh, the standard demographic and health surveys that are done for every developing country in the world, including Madagascar. So existing survey instruments, existing teams that are used to doing this at the national level. The direct the data that we collect are directly comparable to the rest of the country. This is our initial intervention area. These are these are villages, clusters, technically um, data clusters, demographic clusters where the data are collected in our initial area, and then about half from this area and half from these areas. So it's not exactly an experiment, but it's the closest thing we could have to an experiment. And the question is like, okay, we're gonna go in big here, and over time we'll get over here. Um, can, we affect, can we affect change? <clears throat> both from the initial area compared to the rest of the district and then in the district compared to the rest of the country. So just to give you an example, and I wish, I have a, mal a slide like this that's for malnutrition, and given Mark's talk, I would have liked to have just shown that slide, but basically the, well, we have a bunch of individual programs. So one of them is removing financial barriers programs. So this is like one of these, in other words, we've, we, we've in fact removed all financial barriers in the district, which for many people <coughs> sounds very scary. What we do to remove those barriers is we pay the bill on behalf of patients. So what we initially did is we had a really complicated uh, social work survey of patients, families, people dying, determining who could, have, who could afford and who couldn't afford. And what was happening is we were losing, losing lives based on what really amounted to way too arbitrary decisions. And in fact, 80% of the district lives in extreme poverty. So it was a line that we weren't ready. It was a fundamental, it was a line that we, we didn't want to draw. And it became a fundamental barrier to implementing a functional program. So we negotiated with the government to pilot removal of this fee, but we don't even call it removal, we just say reimbursement. The bill is still, the, the, the system of financing is the same. The drugs are ordered from the national system. The, the financing goes up and the, dish, the health centers and hospitals and the regional suppliers get their same, they get their same um, top off markup. Uh, we, just, we just take the bill for the patient. So this is an example of it. Uh, when we implemented this program, this is the average utilization of health centers in our, that we've intervened in in our district. These are the average utilization rates of health centers, of the other health centers in our district. And what you can see is, you know, when we started this program around, um, it's actually around November 2013, uh, you know, um, well, we immediately see, 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 saw huge increases. This is not, here's the interesting thing. If you're an economist, you'd say big, this is like, this, all this means is demand curves are sloped downwards. This is like super uninteresting, right? Like prices went down, people used it. It is, inter but it is interesting. It's interesting because um, often the argument in a place like this that has never had a functioning health system is that people won't use the health system. And that the reason why health centers are empty is because people don't like health centers. And if you want to have a strategy for improving healthcare, you should use a, use a different strategy. So as a starting point, getting people to use the system is really important. This is, this is our stockouts of essential medicines. I selected it as an example of, um, of actually something we're not doing very well. This is because, it's, we, we, at least we know our stockout rates, they're not that great. The, the challenge here is that we only have so much control, we still have the national system. So we work with the staff, the pharmacists to, to order, and we still run out. So it's a big challenge. Again, this is, an, this is a collaborative effort. Um, but maybe just as important is all of this, all this information is actually available in real time. So I can, on my cell phone, I have, I have dashboards on nine different interventions. So um, those dashboards include real-time cost analysis of how much we're paying per patient, real-time stockouts, real-time loss of follow-up or uh, patient success rates for malnutrition programs. And that sounds complicated. It's actually, that's the amazing thing about this is it hasn't been super expensive for us. So we just take the data, we stick into a database. The database has a visualization scheme called Click Data. And um, uh, it has not been a huge, has not been a heavy lift for us, but it's kind of extraordinary. So, so this, this intervention where we removed financial barriers, just to be totally clear, um, 
this is actually outdated. We've treated about uh, 90,000 patients now. It's an old slide, unfortunately. But the, um, it's about 68 cents per patient. So it's, it's sort of what everyone says, what everyone told me 10 years ago. Uh, this is all really cheap, you know, like treating pe people who are about to die is actually tri trivial. The cost of all the drugs is trivial. And in the answers, yeah, that's act absolutely right. It's a totally trivial cost. The patients might be coming, if they're coming twice a year to a health center, that's a great thing. Uh, that's, you know, a buck 60, buck 50. Um, so, or even less. Um, Hospitalization at the, ho at the district hospital, it's more expensive. People are spending the night there. They're getting more care. More physicians are involved. That's still about 26 bucks per patient, per visit. So again, a uh, typical person might go to a hospital once every few years. So those are completely scalable numbers. It doesn't uh, minimize the complicated, important questions about how you sustain the financial system. But it does, at least one side of the ledger indicates that the cost of something like this is not very high. This is our baseline data. We have heat maps of everything that we do. We can do this for every part of our survey. This, they're, they're spatially explicit. So this is, this is the probability of a consultation if someone's sick. Um, this is our, the main road that we're working on. This is the baseline, just to be completely clear. This is not our impact. This is what it was started. Um, this is, there's one paved road, so people were more likely to get treatment, but they weren't super likely to get treatment even there. This is amazing because we get to see the spatial distribution of a change in the health system. What I would say, we get to witness, uh, if, if there's change, if there's real change, we get to witness the transformation in, in the most meaningful ways. So i just throw one example here. Sometimes I give lots of examples because people want pictures. And so in this case, I thought I would just throw a, the community health example. We have an awesome community health worker program. <clears throat> Every village has two community health workers. They, they build these. They, since we've been there, we've, they've built these houses. We provide the sheeting uh, and like the hinges on the doors and the training, of course, and we equip the community health workers. Um, they report directly to the Ministry of Health, but we direct, provide the direct supervision on behalf of the Ministry of Health. This is an inauguration. I'm not a, just for the record, I'm not like a huge fan of throwing myself in photos, but this is an inauguration. This is our community health supervisor team. This is a, this is a physician. These are nurses and midwives. Um, they are the happiest people in our organization because they spend a lot of time in the communities. <clears throat> These are community health workers getting their kits. So right now we have about 100 community health workers that we're supporting. So, um, so we just collected, we had our, um, our second, we, we have, we've, we're doing this longitudinal cohort study. We were able to go to the exact same households that we started at baseline and track them over time. And uh, the data are just coming in. So we're just in the process of our preliminary analysis, and we're able to see things. So for example, just to remind you, this is, this is access to a um, health facility at birth. It's an important variable, if you recall. So if one in 14 women died during childbirth in their lifetime, and again, among the highest in the world. And like, um, like everything when we start, there's a lot of, I call them haters, who say things like, uh, you know, people don't use the health system. They don't want to use the, the formal system. They don't want to have a birth in a health facility. Um, we're not saying they need to come to the facility, but we, we certainly love the idea of people getting the option of, um, of getting treated if they have obstructed labor or not having post-labor hemorrhaging so they don't die in childbirth. And uh, we'd love that people to have that option. So uh, this is our initial, cat you know, we're near the road we started, so our initial birth and health facilities was a little bit higher than the, the rest of the district as a whole. It's about 20% and low enough to have a lot of people die in childbirth. And then in the first two years, just the first two years, we've seen that double, nearly double, right? So these, there's a big proportion of population just to see, you know, here's our, the heat map growing. So our access is growing. This is the road. This is not even a road. So we're seeing, an, we're seeing a signal of, oops, we're seeing a signal of people using the facilities that we've been strengthening, even ones that aren't near the road. <clears throat> so that's a really big improvement. And it's like particularly notable because we don't have a great maternal and child health. We don't have a great maternal program. What we have is what I say. We have an infrastructure program. We have an ambulance program. We have a staff personnel program and training. Uh, so this is, these are systems level interventions that are inducing a lot of that change. <clears throat> this is getting treatment for children with fever. So um, before we started, it was about 20%, probably a ch child getting treated 
at a health facility if they have fever. Um, so in our catchment area, it's about the same as the rest of the area. And so this is sort of the change over time. So you just see, you started seeing this green area start to grow. In particular, you're seeing this double. This is the closest thing you can have to controlled experiment in this space. So it's pretty obvious that um, in the first two years, you know, we're, we're having change. And then <clears throat> under five mortality, so just to be clear, it's about 16% in the district. And it's dropped in our area, catchment area, to under 10, just under 10%, and about 14% in the rest of the district. So this is kind of amazing. So when we were, when we were as these data, just to give you a sense of like the relationship between the intervention and data, and between like the doers and like the data people, um, is that it? Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's great. Uh, I can talk to you about it. So just maybe one final point. We have, because we have data, lots of spatial temporal data, we can start doing a lot of, in, do a lot with that. Satellite imagery of deforestation, machine learning of dynamical systems from these data, more basic research on environmental sampling. That's it. Thank you. I'm sure we have a couple of questions, so we'll take a, we'll take them. Thank you for uh, an interesting talk. My name is Tal Avgarn from Uni University of Guelph. I want to take you back to the beginning of your talk and ask, well, maybe a, a stupid or provocative question, but ecologists like to play what if. What if we could get rid of all mosquitoes? So I'll ask you, if we could get, get rid of all mosquitoes, how many of the world population do we put above the, that poverty line? Or in other words, how much of that disease dynamics is really responsible for keeping people poor? <coughs> So, you know, the nice thing about the what-if question is I don't have to have a good answer for that, right? Like, obviously, I'd be wrong if I had an answer to that question. The, so, I'll, I can tell you what I think, which I think is probably what you're asking. So, no one knows, of course. Like, if you re remove, you know, mosquitoes, what happens to the, to the... But what I would probably say, what I would say is that I think my own view is that well, there's no question that there, there's... There are strong indicators that individual diseases have, can have a pretty big impact on individuals, for sure, obviously killing them and impairing cognitive development and things like that. At the population level, removing a single disease is going to have not as big of an effect as removing all diseases. And in my own view, it, the cumulative effect of lots of infections are a much greater burden, which is one of the reasons why we're interested in a health system that responds to all these infections. Malnutrition might be, and it might be, if there was a single exception to that, malnutrition might be it, in the sense that, like as you put in your slide, half of, all of, half of most infections, are, malnutrition is a contributing factor. It's estimated. So the, the short answer is, I think it's a big deal, the cumulative effect of all these diseases. I think that ex that's part of the story. There's evidence that we've analyzed as part of the story for the global distribution of income. Uh, and, but malaria, mosquitoes per se, be part of that story. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Brad. Uh, as a geographer, I was really drawn to your maps, but especially the lack of the road network. And you mentioned the access, getting someone to the hospital from the health center was a major barrier that you had to overcome. And so I'm kind of wondering, uh, because road and transportation affects a lot more than health care, it affects many other things that would also affect health care. And just based on your work in Rwanda and in Madagascar now, I'm almost thinking if there's one really major first priority perhaps that the government should do would expanding the, or lowering the cost of the barriers to transportation, not just for healthcare, but it would have other impacts. Um, my thinking is that would, be one of, that would be one of the most important first interventions you could do in an area like this. Yeah, okay, I like that question. So the, <laughs> it's about roads. So the, so, you know, I would say I like- Make the, it a what if, the, what the, if we the, had? <laughs> the economists in the would say, transportation and communication are like the, those are transformative foundational things. To, um, they help markets, they help people move, they help people solve problems. The, and if it were free, there's no question. You know, even this road will make you sick driving down it just because it's windy, it has lots of potholes. 
it's the only paved road and it doesn't last that long. So, and the, you know, these are all, this is hilly and mountainous. So um, there are, just to remind everyone, there are no other paved roads in this area. So it takes about two days to walk from here to here. Uh, so it would definitely make a huge difference. So, you know, what we're seeing the only, among the women coming to, this impact is all women who are live within five kilometers of the health center. We're seeing a huge impact, but beyond five kilometers, there's been no impact on the delivery. As one example of that. So a road network would compete. I mean, you're, you're, all, you're seeing it, right, even before. So it's a huge, there's no question, big, big, big important uh, factor. It's just so expensive. And these are rural poor, poor areas. And there's not a lot of like commerce, although that would probably change with their road. So I would say, yeah, I agree. It's a huge thing if it were free. Well, that commerce thing is part of it. The road, uh, transportation, I wouldn't say road, say tr improved transportation would now facilitate commerce and also yeah. help raise income, which would also have an impact on health care. There's just no question, you know. Hi, I'm David Earn from McMaster University. Um, this relates again to something you, you mentioned at the very beginning, and I suppose in relation to the malaria question, but in a broader class of diseases, people often point out the huge difference uh, that is uh, now in terms of the proportion of deaths that are caused by infectious disease, which is like less than 3% in Canada and the United States, versus more than 50% before the antibiotic era. And I'm just wondering whether you have, that doesn't really imply that, that antibiotics are, the, are the, the sole reason for that, but do you have a sense of what, in terms of the broad class of bacterial infections that could be treated with antibiotics if you successfully implemented treatment, what, what kind of proportion of the vast proportion of, the, if I remember correctly, you said more than 50% of, of, of deaths from infectious disease in poverty-stricken areas, what proportion of those would be controlled if antibiotics were, for example, versus education about hygiene and hydration and things like that? Um, hmm. God, I love these. Are, I wish if I were if I were so if I could answer these questions that people were asking me, I'd be I'd have a, I'll have a great career. I mean the the so I don't know the I, I'll put it this way, di diarrhea is obviously it's one of the leading causes of death of, of children under five in all these countries and um, certainly where we are, it's probably the second leading cause of death. Um, antibiotics, uh, antibiotics with oral rehydration therapy almost always saves those lives. Uh, um, I think diarrhea would be the single largest cause of death related to, to, to bacterial infections, although there are others, obviously. So, you know, I don't know what to say to that. It's, uh, it's a big fact. Antibiotics that help, you know. Of course, you know we're seeing we have another paper. We're seeing antibiotic resistance too, you know. So there, it's a it's a its own complicated. The management of antibiotics is its own complicated affair. But yeah, really important. Sorry, I, right, I wish I could. Thanks very much.